travelled up from London to talk to you today. Um, and uh, it's, I think, it's, it's a really, really fantastic opportunity to, to hear what her role as a curator is, the project she's undergoing, and uh, some, some, uh, some events that are involving Hull School of Art and Design, Hull the City, and the Contemporary Art Society. Um, and as a graduate of Goldsmiths University, and um, done the MA in uh, curating. <coughs> and um, the first exhibition I saw of Helen's was in Sheffield at um, Park Hill. And uh, uh, I thought there was something very intriguing about the, the choice of works and the location. And uh, we've had a dialogue since then, and uh, I'm really pleased to introduce her to you. Thanks very much, Des, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm going to talk first of all about um, a range of projects. Um, I've been working with collections, but also um, working with um, younger artists, emerging artists, and also commissioning new work. So working in project spaces, working in museums, and also working off-site in non-museum and gallery spaces. As uh, Des mentioned, um, around 18 months ago in Park Hill in the flats in Sheffield, which I'll mention towards the end of my presentation. So I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes, or maybe a bit less, because um, we started a bit later than we were meant to. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to talk about um, some of my research um, concerning the relationship between property and consumer objects and artworks. Um, and then, um, I want to make clear as well, you can interrupt me at any point during the presentation to ask a question if you have one, but there will also be time for questions at the end. And then there'll be a little break and then I'll talk specifically about my project with Contemporary Art Society, um, which is currently on at Whitechapel Gallery in London and then is touring to Lima and Middlesbrough. And for the second presentation, this project is the one where there's an opportunity for um, students to get involved. So after the second presentation, anyone that's interested um, is invited to come along and hear a little bit more and hear about the opportunity to contribute, come down to London in February and um, maybe showcase some of your own work or some of your research to do with whole time based arts. Um, so I'm going to start off by talking about um, ASMR. I don't know if anybody here knows what ASMR is, it's familiar. <coughs> um, I didn't know what it was up until a couple of years ago. Um, it's a phenomenon that's um, emerged over the internet. ASMR stands for Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response. And um, it's a perceptual phenomena that's characterised by a distinct pleasurable tingling sensation in the head. This is a quote from the ASMR website. So, um, so the sensation is felt in the head, scalp, back or peripheral regions of the body in response to visual, auditory um, or cognitive stimuli. And, um, and there are many videos that have um, been made by sufferers, as they call themselves, of ASMR, um, which I'll show you some of in a minute. Um, but lots of them are kind of characterised by, I suppose, a, um, a kind of pseudo-fetishistic relationship with the consumer object. So some of them include kind of carefully unpacking an object or kind of caressing an object. There's also ones where people are whispering. Um, and kind of playing with materials often, whether they're kind of pouring sugar slowly, or um, there's um, an image here which is of um, somebody standing on a computer, on an apple, and I think this is kind of interesting in relation to the, the bodily and technology, because this is a, a large part of ASMR, is the way in which objects are designed to trigger sensory um, response. And you could kind of call it, as I said, a kind of fetishistic um, response, and it's in some instances described as a brain orgasm. Um, so from this, um, I um, 
became interested in, um, in this idea of um, being at the servitude of an object. So just as I've been talking about consumer objects and the way in which they can seduce us with their design, can art objects play that same role? And um, the title of the show was Thraldom. And here I have the definition. Um, so thrall um, is um, a slave or a serf, one who's held in bondage, one who's intellectually or morally enslaved. Um, so to be um, a, a people enthralled to the miracles of commerce. Um, and And um, I was interested in romantic poetry and also other art forms that have um, the potential for this state of thraldom to enthrall the subject. And um, in this um, instance, often poetry or artwork is um, identifying an individualised consumer. And, um, and within romantic poetry, there's kind of these seductive pastoral vistas and textures um, that can transport um, the reader to, um, I suppose, a place that's kinder to the senses than, um, than industrialization, which was happening in the 19th century um, and, the, and the 18th century at the time of um, its writing. So um, now I'm going to show you some examples. Um, this is one of the artists in the show who um, called Classics. They're a collaboration between two artists. And oh, I need to look it up on here. Sorry. Um, so this is um, an ASMR film which they've made. So these films are uploaded to YouTube and often you know you can subscribe to a YouTube channel um, the followers will kind of suggest what they'd like to be seen um, what they'd like the um, what they'd like the um, the artist to produce again um, but there's this kind of very domestic feel to the setup um, that they have here with the beige carpet and Reebok Classics that she's wearing, uh, um, there's, a big, um, there's a big scene around ASMR and Reebok Classics. So, um, I suppose they've kind of attached themselves to this particular design as an emblem, a kind of cultural emblem of a, um, which fetishizes a kind of working class culture, as well as um, as well as a kind of domestic feel.
So this work is very much about a particular community that exists online. And so the way that the work was shown was as a series of images, um, stills from the video, which were titled with the URLs of the films. Josephine Callahan, and this was um, an installation. So the image on the left is a footage she took of her of her waist against a kind of plaster background. So you have this um, kind of mirroring of the kind of tone of the building in relation to her own body, and so you have her her waist kind of turning this film which she reflected onto this industrial mylar material. And um, she had around three projectors. And, um, and the, the mylar, which is, um, it's used for, um, for reflecting. Um, so in terms of um, growing, um, in industrially growing plants, it's kind of used to reflect sunlight outside and you get this effect of creating this kind of sublime <coughs> um, refracted image on the wall you can see um, on the left hand side refracted from the mylar. So again this kind of relationship between the industrial and the consumer and the objectification of the self in relation to architecture and structures. And then the third and final um, artist in the exhibition was Joey Holder, who um, is actually primarily working online now, um, and she has been doing for the last couple of years, but I, she was a painter before that for about 10 years, and I was really interested in her paintings because um, they're, you know, they're abstract in um, kind of undeniably in all cases, but they're, they're very much um, landscapes as well. And they're, and they're landscapes that are drawn from um, patterns that she's found um, in printed fabric, but also um, in kind of industrial um, design, within industrial design. So um, with this particular work, she's used reflective fabric to, as the base, which she stretched over the, um, the canvas frame. Um, and then she's kind of painted over that intuitively. But then in other works such as this one, um, you can see her kind of working through collage where she, um, she often uses as well kind of images from nature and biology and she looks at the, um, the symbiotic relationship between um, biological design and natural design and industrial design. <coughs> Um, so, moving on from that exhibition, which took place to be exactly a year ago at a project space in North London called Lima Zulu, if you're interested, that's actually a, a space really <coughs> worth looking at. I'll write down, oh, no, it's not going to let me. Lima is. It's like Lima Foxtrot, it's, what do you call that in the language? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's police. So it's, yeah, for their postcode, because they're North London, LM, uh, LZ, so Lima Zulu is kind of spelled in that way, if you look them up. Really interesting um, space, which is collectively run um, by not just artists, but also writers and filmmakers. And um, the guy that was running a lot of the programme there, Ben Vickers, has just been employed as curator of digital at Serpentine Gallery. And if it's interesting, you've kind of seen this move over the last couple of years where museums and galleries have started to employ digital curators for the first time. It's kind of incredible that this technology has been around for so long and artists have been making digital work for so long, but it's only just happened. 
Um, so yeah, just as a side note. Um, so now I'm going to talk about um, how my thinking behind that is kind of related to industry and um, what we think of as the art object. And this is really the story of the 20th century um, in relation to labour and objecthood. Um, so in terms of design, um, you have the establishment of um, a Ford's production line and then how this is transformed into post-Fordism. And, um, and I've been really interested in how art might be a blueprint for post-Fordism. So our shift towards a flexible form of labour and production. So, um, I'll just give a short explanation of um, Fordism before we go into post-Fordism. Um, the assembly line was first mechanised in, um, in 1797, so although um, it really took hold in the 19th century, it was a lot earlier than that, um, or kind of at the beginning, the end of the uh, 18th century. So, um, so Whitney, the man who um, invented the assembly line, he used it to uh, manufacture, he was originally manufacturing muskets that had interchangeable parts. And he was contracted to, to, uh, to supply like 10,000 muskets for the US government in two years. And um, prior to his mechanization for the assembly line, um, the craftsmen would have made these muskets one at a time. So with craft production, um, due to the handmade and custom nature of the process, each musket was unique and um, if a single part of the musket broke, um, it couldn't be easily replaced. But it required custom repair and because parts were manufactured by um, assembly, um, sorry, with Fordism, with, um, with the assembly line, um, parts were interchangeable and common parts could be um, used to replace broken ones. So it made um, the manufacturing a lot easier. This was like a vast improvement to the maintenance and, um, and Ford Motor Company adopted mass production for the Model T in the early 1900s. So the Model T was the first kind of popular motor car um, bought by consumers. Um, What's quite interesting is that the basic kernel for the production line um, allowed Ford's cars to come off the production line in three minute intervals, which was a lot quicker than previously. And um, it was actually increased production by eight to one and um, used a lot less manpower. And it was so successful that um, paint actually became a bottleneck. So only Japan black would dry fast enough. So all of the first Model T cars were black because um, it kind of forced the company to drop all the other colors available um, before 1914. And so um, the rationale for production here is the cheapest, the most high quality, the most efficient product, and um, this efficiency and value for money was based on standardisation. Um, and this affected the lives of the workers as well in a positive way um, because the gains in productivity allowed Ford to increase worker pay from $1.50 um, per day to $5 per day once employees had reached three years. Um, so <coughs> Ford continued to reduce the hourly work week and so um, they had a kind of better quality of life and um, these goals all kind of appeared very altruistic um, but it's actually been argued that they were implemented by Ford in order to reduce the high employment turnover. So when the assembly line was introduced in 1913 it was discovered that every time the company wanted to add a hundred men to its factory personnel it was necessary to hire 963 in order to counteract the kind of natural distaste 
that the assembly line acquired. So, um, I don't know if you guys have looked at Marx, but this is very much about the kind of alienation from labour and the sense in which people didn't feel that they were, um, they had autonomy within their workplace. They were simply doing the same thing over and over again, putting the same bolt on the same screw. Um, a really brilliant film which, um, which has some great footage of um, a bike factory and um, the work of undertaking that kind of monotonous assembly line work a Saturday night, Sunday morning. And um, I remember watching that film a few years back and being quite inspired by it as well. Um, so, moving on from Fordism, because of the standardisation um, of the Model T, because you only had these models coming out in Japan black, so that was the most efficient thing, you had people starting to um, adapt the vehicles themselves and individualise them to reflect their, their own personality and to reflect their tastes. Um, and in 1936, the Ford Coupe was the first customised car um, some of you might have heard of the custom car movement. It's spelt with a K, the custom. And, um, and you can kind of pinpoint this as the beginning of post-Fordism. So um, they would actually adapt the structure of the car. They would change the kind of shapes of the doors and create these kind of biomorphic um, effects and making them kind of streamlined and sexy, as well as kind of changing the colours and changing the interior, they might change the fabric. Um, so each car was unique and um, I would argue that each car was an artwork and the mechanic was an artist. Um, and um, Tom Wolfe, who's um, a gonzo journalist, lots of you have probably heard of Hunter S. Thompson, and Tom Wolfe was around at the same time um, writing similarly about um, particular um, niches within American culture. And in 1965, he wrote an essay, The Candy Colored Tangerine Flake Streamline Baby. So that was the name of a, of a car that he was talking about within this essay about customized car. And he, um, he directly, in this essay, compares the custom car to an artwork. So, um, he talks about, specifically, Brancusi. Um, so, on the left you have the Expat 400, and this was a... Um, this was a kind of travelling exhibition custom car, which is kind of fantastical custom design, um, which was produced in the 1960s. And so it was primarily a showpiece, had no wheels, um, transmission or rear end. As a matter of fact, there were no frictional moving parts at all. Um, the car rode on a five inch cushion of air. It was both drivable on land and water, the body was hand formed from hard aluminium and on breakable fibre glass bucket seat was installed in the cockpit and the seat was covered in white pearl norga hide which is like a fake leather, uh, the carpet of white fake fur um, and it had a telephone and a screen and all kinds of things. Um, the body <coughs> was painted in 35 coats of imported Swedish nitrocellulose lacquer with essence made out of crushed fish scales. So now you kind of start to get this sense of um, the kind of fetishization of the consumer object which happens with post And We've gone all the way from standardised Japan black to 35 layers of imported Swedish fish scales or whatever. <laughs> and um, I think there's even crushed diamond dust in there as well. Um, and um, then I'd like to read a quote um, from Brancusi describing the production 
of Bird and Flight, the work on the right hand side from, um, from the beginning of the 20th century. So he says, I conceived of it to be created in bronze and I made a plaster model of it. This I gave to the founder together with a formula for the bronze alloy and other necessary indications. When the roughest was delivered to me, I had to stop up the air holes, core the hold, correct the various defects and polish the bronze with files and very fine emery. All this I did myself by hand. This artistic finishing takes a very long time and is equivalent to beginning the whole work over again. I didn't allow anyone else to do any of this for me as the subject of the bronze was my very own special creation and nobody but myself could have carried it out to my satisfaction. So it's very much about the craftsmanship, about the authorship and um, the special relationship between the craftsman and his materials which you have with the artwork as a blueprint and now with the consumer object. So, this is a quote, for those that are interested, um, this is from um, Empire by Boltanski and Chiapello, and they talk specifically about the way in which the artist invented the post borders design object. So, by helping to overthrow the conventions bound up with the old domestic world and also to overcome the inflexibilities of the industrial order, bureaucratic hierarchies and standardised production, the artistic critique opened up an opportunity for capitalism to base itself on new forms of control and could commodify new, more individualised and authentic goods. So, um, so the object, which is more authentic, more individualised, you can buy a pair of Nikes now that have your name embroidered on them, or you can specify what kind of finish you want on your car before you buy it. This, of course, adds value to the object. So capitalism is learning from the art object. Um, so. The second exhibition, which I'm actually just going to talk about really briefly, because I also want to talk about the exhibition in Sheffield that Des mentioned. Um, I'm going to talk about the way in which I took these ideas into um, the context of a custom car showroom in London. So this was an exhibition um, where artists were working, um, they were working very quietly, I suppose, within the context of the car showroom. So you had these cars on display that were for sale, and, um, and then the artists had produced a mixtape which was playing inside the car, so you could get in and have a listen. There was um, a desktop um, screensaver playing on the computer um, at the desk of the salesperson that was produced by an artist. The fountain. <clears throat> there were various LCD screens that were usually had kind of ad car adverts on them for particular brands, and one of the artists had taken. Um, images from um, a holiday when she was a child in Italy, that were these kind of very romantic, nostalgic, faded holiday photos which she displayed on these LCD screens. Um, another of the artists um, designed a swimsuit, and this is the fabric for the swimsuit. That's just champagne. I'll just go to the swimsuit. We go. So um, we had a lady there pouring champagne um, who was wearing this swimsuit that had been designed by Susanna. And there were a series of towels which were also on display and um, as part of the launch. 
and there you can see the screen saver, everyone's used up champagne glasses on the desk. And then one of the artists <coughs> organised a dinner for afterwards, which was his contribution. <clears throat> so this idea of art as entertainment, um, where there's no particular definition between the engagement with, um, with the, the consumer context and the artworks themselves. As you can see there, well, because it's a, it's a custom car shop, the um, kind of clientele they get, they get lots of um, footballers coming in to, um, to do up their cars, and so they've got these kind of signed football shirts on display, so we decided to have our model sign the swimsuit, which is still on display next to all the football shirts, which is quite nice. So the final project I'm going to talk about um, am I going to talk about this one? No, it's not going to talk about that one. Um, is the exhibition in Sheffield that Des mentioned. So the first two projects I talked about were very much self-initiated with emerging artists in project spaces or in non-gallery museum spaces on a tiny budget. This is a very different project because it was working with a collection, um, the Arts Council collection. And this was um, a project which I undertook in my second year of curating masters at Goldsmiths. So um, the Arts Council collection was established in 1946 and it's uh, the largest national loan collection of British art and um, they've got more than 8,000 objects now. So they've got a store of two-dimensional work in the Oval in London and they're based at South Bank Centre and then they've got a store of all their sculpture up at Yorkshire Sculpture Park and they, um, and they share the gallery with Yorkshire Sculpture Park um, as well um, next to their store. So the Arts Council collection as I said was set up in 1946 which is the post-war era of welfare state Britain and at this time the argument was that art could provide a better sense of well-being um, for everyone in society and was a driver of social transformation um, and um, this image is of an exhibition, well it's one of a series of exhibitions called Sculpture in the Home and this was a starting point for my research because um, this was, um, they were set up in 1946 and Sculpture in the Home exhibitions ran from 1946 through to the late 1950s and they were exhibitions in domestic buildings so um, often you know domestic buildings would be used for exhibitions but in this circumstance the artworks which were small sculptures were actually displayed next to new decorative designs so the designer of the curtains and the sofa here also <coughs> being featured but the arts council collections role was to um, curate the, the small sculptures which you see on the shelf. Um, the idea being that they were trying to foster um, a middle class who would purchase small affordable artworks for their home. So there's a sense in which um, you know, art was for everyone um, and they wanted it, although I suppose they're fostering a middle class because working class wouldn't have been able to afford them necessarily. They wanted art to feature in homes and to be part of people's everyday lives. Um, so I'm having to deal with two computers. <laughs> and so, um, and so my exhibition was looking at artists who were working during this very optimistic post-war period 
who believed in this kind of English conception of social justice, um, but also alongside contemporary artists who were reworking those kinds of aesthetics. And sometimes the artists reworking them, they'd be nostalgic of looking back on, on these optimistic times fondly, and sometimes they'd be criticising the social design. And the exhibition was cited in, um, in this estate called Park Hill. And Park Hill's in Sheffield behind the station. If you've ever been to Sheffield, you can't really miss it. Um, it was designed in the 1950s to replace the Victorian slum housing and um, then it was completed in 1962 and the residents were transferred street by street from where they were living in the Victorian slums to Park Hill. And this is an image on the bottom right hand side of the original Park Hill. It was very popular at first. Um, but it wasn't looked after or maintained very well by the council and by the 1980s it had become known as a slum estate and um, it wasn't at all a desirable place to live. It was council housing and um, the problematic residents um, were, you know, if, if, if you had a problem with a resident you'd just kind of attempt to move out rather than the council intervening. So. Um, it, in the late 90s, I think, when there was lots of talk of pulling it down and lots of these slum estates were being pulled down, it became listed um, by English Heritage as an important piece of social architecture. And at that point, the council weren't allowed to pull it down, so they ended up giving it to a development company called Urban Splash and selling it to them for a pound. They didn't know what else to do with it. They couldn't find any developers to work on it to sell it to. It was such a big project to be developing. Um, so on the top left-hand corner, you can see an image of the redesigned Park Hill flats that have this anodized steel facade. And um, on the bottom right-hand side, you can see this kind of fade of the bricks, which they've replicated with the steel. And they've kind of reduced the sizes of a lot of the flats and lots of them are now sold commercially, the majority are commercially sold rather than being council flats. So I undertook an exhibition there about one third if that into their redevelopment. So I was exhibiting in the first show flat, the first two show flats that Urban Splash had produced. So um, this is an example of a, of a couple of works from the show. On the left, um, a post-war work by Rod, Robert Adams, and on the right-hand side, um, Dark Unit and Mask by Martin Boyce. Um, he might have heard of because he was up for the Turner Prize that same year that the exhibition happened. So um, I was really interested in the... Um, the um, the kind of recurrent vein of abstraction within the collection that <coughs> reflected the, um, the era of architecture of Park Hill. Park Hill was designed in the 1950s, but the architect was very influenced by constructivism from the continent. And um, constructivism was an kind of avant-garde, revolutionary left-wing movement, but by the time it reached us after the war, it had become this much more conservative and staid um, form of compromised design, I suppose. Um, compromised to fit our, um, our needs, which was post-war housing, high density. Um, so I was interested in the kind of architecture of Park Hill reflecting back into the works I showed in the collection. An artist today, such as Martin Boyce, are kind of revisiting this modernist aesthetic um, in order to kind of critique it on its own terms. So, this uh, work on the right by Boyce includes a splint. Um, the mask is actually made from a splint uh, made by Eames. So, Eames was a furniture designer, Charles and Ray Eames, but um, before they were designing furniture, modernist furniture, they were designing splints during the First World War. So Boyce has appropriated the 
this old splint and made it into a kind of primitive mask. Of course, all the kind of modernists, um, avant-garde on the continent, famously Picasso, De Moselles, for example, very influenced by primitive masks, and so it's a kind of recognisable modernist motif. And then you've got, um, he's kind of taken apart all kinds of bits of furniture, like an Arne Jacobson chair, which is holding up the mask. Arne Jacobson's a Danish designer, so he's kind of taken that from a chair. And then there's a kind of reproduction, not original, but repro modernist desk that it's all sitting on, sideboard thing. So, um, I think I'm going to leave it there for the moment and open it up for questions if anyone has any. curators come to talk to, mm -hmm. to students and you've all had some experience of some kind of curation in some way or another. But for you, do, do you do you find um, do you find a lot a lot of what you're doing is 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 having to kind of the research that you do is a lot of that on a hunch or or, or do, do sort of co coincidences happen as you, the more you research do you get more get more lucky as you as the more you research as I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose you're always you know, testing things out and talking to people as well um, about your research and I think if you have something on your mind, like at the moment I've got time-based work on my mind, so I'm seeing it everywhere. <laughs> um, and I think you know, last year I was thinking a lot about customization and that's still in the background. But I was kind of seeing customization everywhere because it was on my mind. So, yeah, I think um, there's certainly, and you call it like a zeitgeist statement, that's what, they, that's what Benjamin's term for um, a particular spirit of the contemporary. And I think that can happen, um, yeah, it, it can happen. Did this project in a car showroom, and then suddenly I saw some other projects about cars, and I was like, "Oh no, everyone's doing cars! I wanted to do more on them, but now I don't feel like I can do it anymore." <laughs> and it's kind of interesting in terms of taking ownership of research, I suppose, because I only graduated a couple of years ago from Goldsmiths, so I feel like all my research is very connected, but. At the same time, I think it's important to not um, kind of take ownership over ideas or research and kind of move, try to allow it and to be quite freely still. Because in historically, has, has curation changed? Has it changed from yeah. radically? Because, because again, going back to you know, the 30s, we've been curating a degree show. Yeah. So, so there, there, there are. Has, has the history of curation, have, have there been sort of different phases where I, you know, a, a particular trend for kind of curation has given way to another? Yeah, I mean, I suppose um, if you look at curation as a historical construct, it really began during the age of exploration with the cabinets of curiosity, so the um, international travel just beginning and expeditions, people would bring back exotic natural objects as well as kind of anthropological objects, um, you know, from different faiths, of different cultures all over the world, and um, and then these would be constructed into narratives within people's cabinets. So, almost in a similar way to the way we saw those sculptures displayed in the Arts Council exhibition from the 1950s, you know, people would have objects on their shelves, and I'm interested in that kind of relationship with ownership, I suppose, and narrative as well, as then you have the role of the individual um, with the shelf or the cabinet moving into a museum context where then these objects are considered so valuable to cultural production that actually they need to be shared with the public and they need to be available for study. 
And then there needs to be somebody that has a great knowledge of them and looks after them, and that was a curator. So you have the curator as the custodian um, of knowledge and, um, and must look after the physical welfare of the objects themselves. Um, but um, you know, today we think about curating in a much wider sense in terms of programming. You hear, you know, curating so and so's Shellac's curating ATP festival, or you know, it's used in relation to even not just culture, kind of more widely than culture. I would say I'm trying to think of an example, but you're probably told that you could kind of curate your meal. <laughs> a restaurant or your menu or yeah I think it's it's kind of entered a popular domain now where it means an arrangement so I think often people who don't have a knowledge of the specificities of working within fine art curating when I say I'm a curator they think, you just put stuff together that's easy <laughs> but um, yeah I think it's I think the, the way in which there's been a continuity in the role of the curator all the way from the cabinet of curiosity to, um, to the curator of popular culture today, I think is the idea of the curator as the custodian or the gatekeeper. Um, so it's an incredibly powerful position to be in, in terms of deciding access to culture so there's 8,000 objects in the Arts Council collection or more. Now, I can't have all of them. I don't have a choice of all of them because some of them are on permanent display. Lots of them are on display in temporary exhibitions um, all over the world. But I still have an enormous choice in terms of you know, the narrative I choose, the lens through which I choose to display them as well as which ones I select. And so, yeah, I think... A lot of responsibility in that sense. It needs to be taken seriously as a discipline. And that consideration of the audience um, and the kind of complicity of the relationship between the audience and the way that they're viewing the work is something that I think is really important. So, so tell me if I'm just rambling. <laughs> um, for example, in the Sheffield project, you know, the the redesign, the refurbishment of Park Hill was a very controversial move by Urban Splash because they were kicking out lots of council tenants. Although it was considered a failure, some people still loved it. Um, you know, it's privatisation, etc. And, um, and so this exhibition was an opportunity for people not just to see the exhibition, but also an opportunity to have an architectural tour and to engage with the debate over um, the redesign of Park Hill. So that's, that was all part of the process. And then kind of considering that relationship with the audience and the work, say in the car show in Auto Couture, um, there, was a, there was a non-art audience as well as an art audience. Know, people were just wandering in off the street because they just thought it was a kind of opportunity to come and see this new car that had been um, custom designed and um, it was a kind of free for all with booze and um, the spectacle. You know, we had journalists there, we weren't sure which ones we'd hired, which ones had come from papers turned up, and all kinds of things. <coughs> it took on its own life, I suppose. Um, and I think that that's really important, and that's that's really interesting for me. If it if it goes beyond, not only beyond um, my expectations of the discussion I've set up, but if it goes beyond the limits of the art world as well, and it involves attention and an audience beyond that, that's what I want to achieve. Yeah. I've got um, quite an interest in sort of the internet and how we instantly forget now in terms of display 
I was thinking during your talk, and the talk between Fordism and post Fordism, how that would relate to the internet and time-based work, and if you'd ever consider curating on the internet or with the internet. Yeah, well, um, the project that I'm going to be talking about after a little break includes four internet artworks by Heath Bunting, um, which were, three of which were commissioned for whole time based arts. Um, and there are lots of artists who are working online now. Um, you know, there's the generation of net.art that Heath was part of that's considered to be from 1994 to 1999. And now there's talk of post-internet art, which, of which I have an artist in my show as well, Oliver Larrick. And, um, and the post-internet idea is that it's a generation in which the internet is no longer um, a novelty. It's ubiquitous, it's built into our everyday um, form of communication, and so we're not, we're not considering it to be a special space outside the politics of everyday life, which I think it represented to the artists working in the 90s. Now I think the internet's become corporatised and it's, um, it's a different space. So I think in terms of time-based work, I'm really interested in um, artists who are um, working across social networks. There's quite a few artists who are working across social networks to um, reflect their identity and talk about identity politics online, for example. So how is our identity constructed through social networks and um, through tagging and through, um, and everyone knows that companies are making money from picking up on details about our identity and advertising back to us. Um, so there are lots of artists that are working with that, but then kind of pushing back and constructing works which, um, I suppose, um, enter into a dialogue with these kind of automatic bots that are just pushing out um, the artist. Depends if the artist is still alive or not. This shows from 1946, so only around half the artists are alive. And I didn't have an opportunity to talk to all of them. Martin Boyce was kind of shooting off stratospherically in his career, so he didn't have any time to talk to me, unfortunately. Um, and, um, you know, in contrast, for the exhibition I'm going to talk about after the break, I mentioned Heath Bunting and his online works. There's been a lot of discussion between me and Heath um, as to how to best show his works because they're websites. Some of them include broken links. What do we do about that? Do we leave it as a broken link because that says something about the internet becoming a ruin after a certain <coughs> amount of time? Or do we try and reconstruct it? And they're really interesting questions that are really important to, um, to the, the way the work is carried forward um, and theorised because you know, that work isn't often exhibited. Um, so you feel like there's more at stake working with an artist like Heath. Um, 
because you know that your words are going to be probably read by a lot of people percentage-wise who are researching heat in the future in comparison to Martin who's got a million you know, higher profile solo shows happening with much more important authors. <laughs> so um, I really enjoy, um, I mean I enjoy both because it's incredible to have an opportunity to work with an artist of Martin's profile but at the same time I think I get a lot more out of maybe that, that close conversation with Heath and just for every, every artwork is different and the way it's shown depends on you know who else is in the exhibition and what is the space and um, there are yeah, many many conversations to be had but it's also really exciting working with working with artists where they're presenting new work as well because then you go on studio visits with them and you might see a work in progress before it's completed and you know, it's, it's really a kind of collaborative process that I have with probably about four artists so I've worked with them you know across five, five years or something you know even if we haven't done a show together some years like we'll always be talking to each other about our projects and we're kind of affecting each other's practices so um, it's very kind of symbiotic totally inside their practice or I can be kind of totally on the outside but still appreciate it I suppose. So, so now I'm going to talk about another collections project. So before I was talking about um, the project in Park Hill with the Arts Council collection, um, this project, um, Dan Brace's Less Relaxes, um, is a fellowship um, it's a collaboration between the Contemporary Art Society and Whitechapel Gallery in London. So Whitechapel Gallery in London has a gallery that's specifically for collections. So the whole programme um, is there to showcase public and private collections. Um, and the display I'm doing is part of the public collections display. And um, it's in collaboration with Contemporary Art Society. And they're a society that were established at the beginning of the 20th century, at just within the same few years as the Art Fund. So you might have seen um, when you're in museums, next to uh, artworks on the label, it has like a Contemporary Art Society or an Art Fund logo. And it's basically the function of these organisations is to assist municipal public galleries in purchasing works of their collection. So they have museums who pay a membership fee to them um, in order to benefit um, and receive works into their collection. And then they have patrons who bequeath money when they die, but they also give money as a membership and um, as a contribution. And um, and so the Contemporary Art Society appointed four fellows working across the country um, to do a year of programming. So my exhibition's just over three months. Um, the first fellowship, which was uh, the North West, um, was before me. And then there's somebody that's going to be doing the Midlands and the South. So um, I suppose this is one of the reasons why I'm in Hull. Um, Des invited me after the Sheffield project to come and talk, but then something got in the way. And then I said, I'm doing a project which includes Hull, so I'll come and talk about that. So the East Coast includes all the way from Sunderland down to Norwich. And there's around 15 museums that are Contemporary Art Society member museums. And I've ended up working with around six of them. Um, and I've worked specifically looking at the regions of... Um, Newcastle and Sunderland, Hull, Norwich and Lincolnshire. Um, and the theme of the project um, is really landscape of property and freedom. Um, so I've been looking at three stages of privatisation of landscape um, on the East Coast. The first one being um, common landscape. 
So um, common medieval land law and the gradual enclosure of land. Um, Thatcher's privatisation of um, national services and resources. <coughs> and then the privatisation of the internet. And I'll go into those three types of privatisation, how they're reflected in the show, um, in a moment. But before I do, I just wanted to explain about the title. So the exhibition not only includes um, 19th century landscape through to contemporary art, it also includes poetry. And, um, and the title of the exhibition is taken from William Blake's Proverbs of Hell which were written in 1789, the year of the storming of the Bastille, the French Revolution. And um, they're a series of um, proverbs which criticise the morality and restraint of institutions. And, um, and in this exhibition I'm looking at constraint and what's the line between restraint and constraint in property <coughs> rights. And Blake evokes this kind of delight in excess and self-abandon and abandonment of, um, of boundaries. And, um, and for him, freedom means not being tied to a place or a person, um, forgetting about sexual property, so he was very influential upon the free love movement. And um, within that, the kind of virtues of labour and the freedom of the individual um, is really uh, at the forefront in relation to structural and institutional ties. And for Blake, those institutional ties are very much the church <clears throat> at his time of writing. So, um, one, of, um, one of the prerequisites of my fellowship was that I looked at the relationship between art schools and collections. So um, I started off by looking at, um, in Norwich, the Norwich Society of Artists. And the Norwich Society of Artists began the beginning of the 19th century. And um, they were a group of artists who, um, who really were kind of self-initiating in a shared form of education. And John Crone, who was a landscape artist, um, and Labrook established the society, but it was later um, um, John Sel Cotman who was the president from 1812. <clears throat> and I discovered um, these really interesting images of the landscape um, around Norwich, um, which was previously common land. So, um, so common land. <clears throat> is owned and worked in common and um, historically it provided a minimum welfare for the poorest enabling them to sustain pasturage which is grazing livestock, piscary, fishing, tuberi, burning turf and estova which is burning or building with wood and they also had the right to glean after harvest so after the harvest you were allowed on this common land to go and pick up whatever was left of the harvest. During the Saxon age, all village land was assumed to be commonly owned and worked with the exception of a few enclosed areas. And after 1066, following the Norman conquest, um, land was associated with a local manor and therefore there was a landlord. And um, common rights were bestowed by the lord to the commoners. Um, from the 15th throughout the 16th century, land that was previously granted as common by the landlords was gradually enclosed. So they began to put fences up and work the land to more economically efficient use. Um, and during the 18th and 19th century, with the Industrial Revolution in full swing, this became a centrally led government policy. So the motivation for enclosing the land was to do with the shifts in technology and they, you know, they drained the land to make it, um, to make it um, possible to, um, to produce a better crop and they, um, they introduced crop rotation and um, all kinds of centrally, or centrally organised forms of work in the land which created a larger yield. And then of course there were resources to be mined, so um, there's all kinds of reasons which are 
tied to economics, really. Um, so, this is an image of Kett's Castle, which is on a uh, mousehold heath. And so, um, you know, many areas of parkland that we have now are either heath or common, um, were mostly common land. And so this is one of them. And Kett's Castle um, is the romantic local name for the ruins of St Michael's Chapel, um, renamed following Robert Kett's 1549 rebellion. So, as I said, these fences were going up as part of the enclosure. And in 1549, um, these peasants were walking around, pulling down these fences, and Robert Kett was a landlord who, when he found the peasants pulling down the fences, said, what are you doing? And he got into a discussion with them, so the story goes. And <clears throat> he actually decided to take the sides of the peasants. And he led a peasant revolt against the privatisation of the land, which included more than 16,000 re rebels. And the, um, from London, the government sent forces um, European forces, because they didn't want British soldiers fighting their own people. Um, they sent them to fight the rebels, and within a couple of months, the rebels were defeated. Robert Kett was sent to the Tower of London, and then eventually hung from the gallows at Norwich Castle, which was a jail. <clears throat> so, you have this this story of a, um, a really an enemy of the of the state, Robert Kett, um, suddenly associated with this picturesque um, landscape, which is romanticised by the Norwich Society of Artists. And in fact, today Norwich Castle, which used to be the jail, is a museum which holds a lot of these works. And I noticed on the outside of Norwich Castle a plaque, and it commemorates Robert Kett. And it says um, that, oh, I haven't got the text here, I should have it. Um, and it, um, it basically draws a parallel between the struggle of working people. So it says, I'd like to commemorate Robert Kett, and this plaque ends up in 1949, 400 years after the rebellion commemorating Robert Kett for fighting for the rights of the common citizens of Norwich. And I found out that the person that um, initiated this plaque was um, a socialist politician who, at the beginning of the 19th century, was himself jailed in Norwich Castle. Sorry, at the beginning of the 20th century, it would have been. Um, he, was, he was jailed in Norwich Castle for his part in food riots because he started the Socialist League in Norwich. He then ended up becoming a Labour politician and becoming a mayor of, Nor of Norwich, so he was in a position to erect this plaque. But it's interesting, the, um, it, it drew, drew the line between the struggle of landed people um, in the 16th century and labouring people in the 20th century. So, the second image is um, of the area around um, the castle, Mousehold Heath. And the artist, John Cotman, he was born in 1782. And so he only just would have remembered the open heath because the enclosure began in the 1790s. And, um, and it shows a very romanticised partial kind of summer day. Cotman was said to have, um, have played in, in the heath when he was a child. And you can see these roots through the landscape that have been very organically carved by hundreds of years of, of free roaming throughout the landscape. Um, the Norwich Society, they, you know, you have these landscape paintings that the same view is um, repeated again and again and again. And um, in the uh, British Museum, there's a very similar version from the same year by Cotman of this view. 
Um, but it's interesting because it includes an area of enclosure. So on the right hand side you have a hedge and you know it would be hedges or fences that indicated private land. So this is um, this is the image which shows no fences or land. It's free this case of individuals freely roaming across the landscape. <coughs> So, um, <coughs> moving on to Lincolnshire, um, this is a painting by Peter de Wint, um, and it shows gleaners. And as I mentioned before, gleaning was a right of commoners, um, that after the harvest they could go and collect what was left over. And along with privatisation, you have the outlawing of gleaning. And um, this was painted after gleaning was outlawed in this particular territory in Lincolnshire. So I was really interested in the, um, in the fact that these, these paintings are considered to be conservative in their depiction of uh, an English peasant and kind of romanticizing this, um, this green and pleasant land in Blake's words. But in fact, it's an incredibly political image where the artist has inserted the gleaners as you can see on the right hand side um, and they, they wouldn't have been there in this view certainly. This um, is a, another image, um, a, a watercolour by De Wint which, um, which shows the land um, before enclosure and often the argument was that it was now but bracketed <coughs> um, and it wasn't arable and so it needed to be um, it needed to be enclosed in order to be developed properly. And then you have, sorry the images are a bit dodgy, I was given it by the museum. Um, this is um, this is a gate that DeWin painted, um, which is um, where tenants who rented property from the church came to pay their rent. So it's a 14th century ceremonial access point for the cathedral. And, um, and so contrasted within the exhibition, um, you know, these open landscapes, because De Wint's work shows these kind of endless landscapes, very kind of flat land in Lincolnshire, with these boundaries and walls. Um, and as I said, the exhibition includes um, poetry. So Tennyson, famous Lincolnshire poet, I borrowed some manuscripts um, from the, the Tennyson Library, and um, his poems include descriptions of the open world and heath, as well as, um, as I was saying, the kind of descriptions of um, the reasons for enclosing the land, that it's now but bracken and fuzz. And Tennyson um, owned a copy of William Blake's Book of Yo, which is shown on the right hand side, which is in the exhibition. And um, Book of Yo is a biblical story, which um, is a story in which um, God allows Satan to take away the worldly possessions of a man called Yo. So he's quite well off, he's got lots of animals, he's got a healthy family, and Satan says to God, well, Job's a very, very godly man, but would he be so godly if he didn't have this material wealth? Would he still have faith? And so let's test his faith and take them away, and he loses all his possessions, he becomes diseased, and in this image you can see God explaining to Job and his wife the creation of the material world, which is um, this beast um, which you can see on the top and the bottom is a serpent that re represents sea life. And um, I think it's interesting in this image as well that Lake shows clouds around the outside of the material world and related to the divine. And, um, and I have later look at um, Constable um, and, and clouds as this um, otherworldly space and the kind of associations with freedom therein. So, um, you know, with the industrialisation that 
was happening um, during the period when Constable was painting, instead of painting the industry, instead, what's he doing? He's looking up to the clouds, the sort of sense of escape and freedom. I think carries through in our relationship to technology today. When we talk about the cloud in terms of computing, as in data storage, and the kind of freedom we associate with that, and the and the will to separate from the um, kind of abject nature of the material um, reality of burning coal and etc. And you know, actually, data storage is warehouses off the motorway, which are totally unsustainable. So I think we still continue to have this very romantic relationship um, or associations with, um, with these forms. So, um, now moving on to Hull. Um, for those that don't know, I'll just give a, a quick rundown of Hull Time Based Arts. Um, so Hull Time Based Arts ran from 1984 to 2002. It was an artist-led commissioning organisation that focused on artistic practices that incorporated performance and technology and uh, many collective actions um, such as um, throwing bricks in the town square, um, which was a performance that took place outside Ferrin's Art Gallery, um, just near here. Um, that was um, actually on the bicentenary of the French Revolution. and. Um, and they were um, it was a kind of week-long workshop that referred to you know, anti-establishment, other kind of co-produced art movements such as Situationists and Fluxus, and um, raised issues around territory on and offline. So um, they had a yearly festival called Root, which stood for running out of time. And um, for the festival, they commissioned time-based media in the widest sense, so they encompass performance, visual, sound, new media work, digital technologies and participation. And all of these were kind of radical experiments with materials and um, delivered statements that concerned global politics rather than just their local politics and they invited international artists. And uh, many students were involved from um, a time-based course that ran at Humberside College. So um, they were operating during the Thatcher era and they had this kind of punkish attitude which was very much outside the art market and opposed to what was happening with say the YBAs in contrast. And, um, and key figures um, such as Rob Borthrock who's going to come to visit you in January and um, Gillian Dyson were, were teachers on this time-based MA, but also ran um, and were involved in, um, in the festival. And, um, and this course, um, the time-based course, was quite a significant precursor to um, what's become a ubiquity, the time-based media course. So, um, you know, I think it was quite an exciting time to be in Hull. And, um, this image is a still from um, a video um, which documented the Root Festival of 1992. And I think it does really well to um, communicate um, this, um, this relationship with, of, um, between freedom and working without boundaries that carries all the way through from Blake. Um, and so I'll just read it out. With all this talk of walls falling, I should say Mike Stubbs, who this quote's from, was the director of um, Whole Time Based Arts for many years. So, with all these talk, this talk of walls falling, boundaries breaking, and free trading, it's sickening to see the rise of fascism across Europe. Until the internal perceptive boundaries change, along with the physical ones, xenophobia will persist. A limited view of the world will only be challenged through education, stimulation and communication, bringing together, um, bringing together artists from across Europe to make work in Hull as part of Route 92 plays a small part in this process. So 
when he says all this talk of walls falling, this was only three years after the fall of the Berlin Wall. So I think that's what he's referring to. But he worked with many, um, many European or partners, especially as well as South American. But there were sort of new media um, festivals that are equivalent, like Ars Electronica, um, that Mike was tied to. And so um, I think it was quite exciting every year for um, for the students, the art students in whole, to have an opportunity to engage in these ideas of global politics on a, um, in relation to time-based art. For um, the exhibition at Whitechapel, I have um, I've borrowed archival material directly from artists, but I've also um, borrowed from the Bristol Live Art Archive. So um, just last year, Gillian Dyson, who I mentioned, who used to be a teacher on the time-based course, she organised for um, the archive of whole time-based arts to go to Bristol University. And so um, I think this is really interesting in relation to collections <coughs> and time-based media as well, because I was appointed as a fellow to work with collections, and then I found that in Hull, what I was really interested in was whole time-based arts and Ferrum's Art Gallery, um, although they have a live art space which was built as a response to support Root Festival. They don't actually hold any of the works that were commissioned um, by whole time-based arts in their collection because that, that wasn't why the artists were making work to make objects. They were making it for an experiential um, experience, for experiential um, outcome for the audience. So, um, so I'm really interested in this, um, in this relationship between the archive and the collection and, and what we can call an artwork um, if it was, um, if its function at the time was to initiate an experience rather than to be an object in itself. So I'm, um, I'm showing in a vitrine in an archival display, um, work by Simon Poulter, which was commissioned um, by them, by Whole Time Based Arts. And this um, is an image of one of the press releases, which was um, for a project um, which responded to the tail end of Thatcher's privatisation of resources. So you had um, British Telecom, British Gas, and British Airways, all these companies being sold off that were previously public and um, and then they tried to sell off Royal Mail which didn't happen at the time because there was such an enormous outcry people talked about selling off the crown jewels and I think Royal Mail has now been sold hasn't it just this year um, but um, at this moment of, kind of public backlash where they were saying look privatisation has just gone too far um, Simon launched this media manipulation campaign, as he calls it, to, um, to make Stonehenge into a theme park and to replace Stonehenge with a fiberglass copy and um, to sell shares in it as a company. Um, and so you have this series of press releases that went out to the larger press um, and sees, um, you know, not just the art press, so um, all kinds of big papers like the Times and Radio 4 um, ran stories on it. Um, so Simon set up as a company, UK Limited, which he claimed to be um, the director of and talked on behalf of. He produced a lot of marketing material um, and he went to the Tory party conference in Bournemouth and doorstepped politicians and talked to the media there. He, um, he set up shop in art galleries, so it did exist in an art context as well. He had a launch at Ferenc Gallery and ICA. And, and this is an image on the left of a share, so he was giving away these shares would get stamped if he came to a flotation party and I asked him what a flotation party is and he just said it was lots of really bad wine and onion rings <laughs> and him dressed in a suit um, 
talking about uh, Stonehenge. <laughs> And um, so now I'm going to talk about uh, Fran Cottel. She, um, she's a, an artist who was commissioned by Time Based Arts, so I found out about her through uh, Time Based Arts, but I ended up not actually including one of her projects from them. This one was commissioned by um, Lane Art Gallery in Newcastle. <coughs> and for this she invited on an open call advert in The Guardian, I think, um, women to come along to spend the day um, walking across the um, across the Pennines in what she described as a, a neutral piece of territory just near Hadrian's Wall. And so this is very much the idea of um, taking the landscape as a metaphor for time. So here are the women walking. And they were walking with stakes. <clears throat> to which they attach their wishes and um, stake them into the ground. And, um, and so this work um, includes documentation images and um, the marketing material, but also um, she um, Fran undertook interviews with the women afterwards about their experience. And they talk a lot about living under Thatcher's government, living within a patriarchal um, historical landscape so um, of course Hadrian's Wall and the, um, the, the history around that they're going to say how often do you hear about what the women were doing in <laughs> um, those battles and, um, and there's, this, um, there's this idea of, um, of labour and landscape which I think um, really comes into things when you get an opportunity to hear the audio this is marketing material and the schedule and the route that was kind of drawn out and the women all coming from different directions um, across the landscape. Um, now I'm going to talk about Heath Bunting who I mentioned before and um, Heath Bunting is a, um, an artist who is working online and, um, and now is working offline. So he was part of the Net Art era, and he um, received commissions from whole time based arts across the mid '90s. And this was his first ever commission, um, which was for 50 pounds. And with this, he chose to set up an online form. Um, and so, in 1996, when this was produced, um, buying online and giving your credit card details. Um, was not considered a safe way to purchase. And, um, and he kind of draws this parallel with the Victorian beggar in his language, which I think is really brilliant. Um, and um, he actually hacked this into um, a lot of corporate websites and managed to make thousands of pounds um, through people kind of falsely thinking it was part of a, a corporate giving scheme, which I don't know how. <laughs> And, um, and before he was working online, Heath was a graffiti artist and he spent a lot of time kind of wandering the streets and um, thinking about geographical, physical boundaries. So then his relationship with the internet was very much engaged in these ideas as well. And um, on the right hand side, or is it? Yeah, it's on your right, um, is an image of a Geordie clown. Who, um, who performed at agricultural fairs in the 19th century. And he, um, he performed this skit, Stealing the Bundle. And I've got a few, um, I've got a couple of images of him in the exhibition. Um, because this is in relation to, um, again, the common laws and enclosure. And the way in which practices that commoners had been undertaking for centuries, such as collecting firewood, suddenly made them into a criminal. And so um, you can see a similar thing has happened on the internet now, whereas you know, people saw the internet as a free space to share their files and duplicate them and do whatever they like. Um, suddenly, um, you know, people just undertaking um, file sharing, there are still thousands of them out there, 
and it's difficult to stop them, are considered common criminals. Um, and, um, and of course, there have been you know, the equivalent of the Enclosure Act um, in terms of data protection acts that have um, enclosed the internet in terms of property. Um, I was talking a little bit before about, um, about revisiting net-based work. And um, this is an interesting example. It's another work by Heath, and it's called Rootless. Well, in fact, it's Heath, Bunting, and Rachel Baker are working together for this commission. And they, um, they hitchhiked across the country. And as they hitchhiked, they were aimlessly traveling, I should say. They weren't aiming to go to any particular place. They went anywhere that anyone was willing to take them. They then linked their location. Um, online, and this is a kind of series of links which originally would have been in the shape of the British Isles, but has since kind of disintegrated as the links have broken, and um, and the links have, um, you know, some of them still work, but a lot of them don't, and um, we decided to keep it broken rather than remake it. Um, on the right hand side you have <coughs> travellers off the shore um, of the east coast which again kind of reflects this itinerancy, um, this continued kind of romanticisation of itinerancy. Uh, what time are we on? I think we should probably open it up for discussion, shouldn't we? Otherwise I could kind of go on and on. Um, <laughs> I mean, I yeah, I mean, just to sort of frame it then, um, um, Helen, you're, you're um, and for, th for the benefit of people who, who might, mm. some of you who are working on the Ferens collection, um, yeah. um, your, your role is sort of as, as a curator, as the keeper of this, and you're, you've, you're sort of looking at geography and also, because you've got this kind of swathe of the country to use, mm -hmm. 200, 200 devices, you've had to really kind of edit this down then, but with a foot in in the old world, the sort of middle world, and now, yeah. now Yeah, absolutely. Uh. Um, and, um, and maybe I should just mention, um, you know, what the potential involvement is of yes. the students. Um, in February, on February 13th, the day before Valentine's Day, um, there will be a get-together, a symposium at Whitechapel where um, some of the artists, such as Heath, who will be there, um, and Fran will be there, Fran Cattell, um, and also some, um, some theorists who I've invited, and Mike Stubbs, who is a former director of Whole Time Based Arts, they'll be um, speaking um, on a range of subjects and across um, time-based media, and then also in terms of the romantic relationship of the artist to the landscape. And then finally there'll be a group that looks at the commons. And I'd invited students um, from Hull College and um, students from the Goldsmith Curating MA, which I studied on. And then also some students from Sunderland um, who are involved in CRUM, which is um, new media curating. Um, course, um, I've invited them to come and participate in some way. And so, um, for you guys, the invitation is to um, take part in a panel which will be specifically about Hull and about time-based media. And, um, and that panel is an hour and a half. So within that, um, Rob Gawthrop, who, as I mentioned, ran the time-based media course, and Mike Stubb, who was director of Whole Time Based Arts, they'll be in conversation for around half an hour, um, and talking about the history of the school and time-based course, and then um, Heath Bunting is going to undertake some kind of workshop, um, which you could potentially collaborate with him on, um, because he's going to come and visit, along with Rob in January, he's going to come and visit you guys in Hull. Um, and so you could, um, I was just talking to Lou about how you could potentially collaborate with Rob and Mike by, you know, 
having some special documentation of their conversation while it's happening, or some, some other kind of response. And then also, similarly with Heath, you can talk to them about that in January. Then there's also a half an hour slot for you to present your own contribution. Whether that is an artistic response, whether that's a research-based response, I'm absolutely open. Um, but I'm, yeah, I know some of you have already been working with Lou on this, and if it piques anyone else's interest, then stick around and I'll be here until about half four um, to talk to anyone um, who's interested and um, see what those who have already made a start have come up with. Um, we can do that here, and Helen, we can yeah. well stay, stay on here. We'll yeah, absolutely. Address. And I think Brian's got some material to show us as yes. well. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, so Brian was around during the days of the time-based course, and Lou studied on the time-based course. Um, and I think it sort of needs to be said that the, the in the pre previous incarnation of this institution, that's that, that this course ran here. Mm -hmm. Of course, you could study it. Mm -hmm. So we've got, a, we've got a kind of direct link with that. So, does anyone have any questions, I suppose, before we go into a, a focused discussion about February and potential contributions? Does anyone have any questions um, that they want to ask? But then they want leave before the other discussion begins. <coughs> Even about curating. Yeah. So, in that case, Helen, um, yeah, uh, thank you very much for taking time to, to, uh, to talk to us. Thanks for having me. And, um, it's, um, yeah, and <coughs> if anybody wants to stick around, um, again, we'll have a, you know, if anybody wants to go on a quick cup of coffee or something, um, we'll, we'll be here for a, a, a chat conversation and look at what Brian's got to show us. And we've got a DVD to, that Lou's burned to Oh, great. Blue line. So that interesting one, it has to be said that if you want if you want to get involved in this, everything you do in this project is effectively part of your practice. So so the, the, the seminar, the symposium we do in White, in, in White Chapel Gallery, it's something that I'll be laying on for you. So to get, to getting you down there and back again is taking care of. I don't mean to, it won't be out of your pocket. Um, uh, if that's uh, just 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 for the record, but any 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 involvement in this project can can directly be considered. And you know, I consider that part of your practice, your wider practice, your research practice. So just be mindful of that. It's not ex, it's not an additional extra way we want to make you, but it, I think it's just a fabulous opportunity. Well, I know it is a fabulous opportunity. So, okay, thank you very much, and thank you for your time. Uh -huh.